Jai Hind, Jai Bharat, and welcome to Dev Talks. This is Adi Chint. I have with me someone really special who has integrated himself into the Indian system, Professor Salvatore Barbons, who has actually featured on this channel for a, a very interesting dual talk, if I may. We did a show with General Narayan to understand what these narratives are. So, Professor, thank you so much for joining me. I want to learn from you to understand what your experiences have been around India. What has it been that you've kind of... Have you changed your thought process, the whole narrative game within India? Well, it's great to be here, and thank you for the invitation back to the show. Uh, of course, I've learned a lot as I've gotten uh, you know more India exposure, and I've met so many people uh, from and connected to India. But I try as hard as possible not to let it affect my thought processes. Uh, that is my goal in everything I've written about India, or for that matter, anywhere else, is to be as objective as possible. And that means that my personal experiences really don't count for much. Uh, and in fact, I very much try to separate these two things. You know, my personal experiences, which certainly go into things like the jokes I make on Twitter. Right? Okay, well, if you're going to make a joke or say something humorous, having that bit of nuance really helps you understand the, the psyche that you're appealing to. But academic writing or even writing opinion pieces, all of that is, is driven by the data, you know, driven by the data, driven by historical knowledge, driven by expert analysis. Um, but I try to keep out of it anything that I might get from just general impressions or get from friends. I mean, I, I'm constantly assailed by people who want to teach me about India. <laughs> you want to tell me the truth, quote unquote, about something. And I'm always, frankly, maybe impolitely pushing them away because uh, I'm very committed to the idea that whatever you may know about India, there are 1.4 billion people who disagree with you. That's a very interesting perspective, sir. But what I want to ask you is something very basic in the game. What we're seeing within India today is a very changed perspective. And we're also seeing that coming in from the Western world. Having said that, there are certain sects which don't really agree with that change. Which is which is which is fine. If there are two people, they will not follow the same path. That's okay. How do you see these two sects interacting within the society of today? Clearly, there's an old India, new India conflict, and it's not even that new because it really goes back at least a century. Because I, I would say that it, in its origins, it's a conflict between two elites in India, uh, a, a comprador elite or an English stand elite, if you will, you know, people connected to the English language, connected to Western and colonial and colonial and now Western powers, people who have access to the international, the international sphere, sphere and a national elite, which is to say people whose careers and mindsets have been developed entirely within India. And those two groups the comprador elite and the national elite, you could translate if you want for a non-technical audience as old India and new India, but their conflict goes back to a time before independence, you know, to the independence movement itself, where there were debates about what character an Indian independent India would and should have. Uh, now, it's the only thing that's changed in the last... 10 years or so, you know, people want to date it to 2014, that's fine. But, you know, in this century, what's changed is that the national elite have become, relatively speaking, more powerful, more prominent, certainly richer. Uh, I tell people you can see this visually if you go to Delhi and you go to the notorious, you know, con market. <laughs> Everyone talks about the con market gang. Uh, well, the con market used to be the you know, the center of things, right? Or if not the con market, then the markets in Old Delhi. Any one of the shopping malls in Noida now does higher turnover, I'm willing to bet, than the entire city center of Delhi does in terms of retail sales. And uh, that's not a statistic you can quote me on. That's a metaphor, okay, just to be clear. But the, the idea is, the heart of that idea is valid, which is to say that Old India is still there. Old India still has the same kinds of uh, expectations that it's always had. Old India still has a lot of prestige. 
But new India is just so much bigger, richer, and more powerful than old India ever was that old India is becoming irrelevant. And that, of course, makes people very upset to lose their relevance in a country that they and their social class have controlled, well, for at least 100 and maybe more years. When you talk about the old India, what is it that you're referring to? Because there are categorizations in that. One is the old India, which is the India, India. There is the other categorization of uh, people who got educated in the West and uh, their families kind of perpetuated after that. I'm not talking about ancient India. When, when, when I'm saying old India, I mean those Indians who were at the top of India's social structure during the colonial era. Uh, those Indians who made a compromise with the colonial British and many of them before that with colonial Mughals and who rose and flourished in those environments and then who ultimately came to lead India, India into independence. Uh, well, that social class has lost its grip on the country. Uh, and that's clear for anyone to see. I'm not the only one to observe this. I think it's pretty obvious when you look at whether it's Indian politics today or Indian economics or Indian culture, this tension is palpable. Now, there are other fault lines in India. I mean, this is the key fault line, but there's obviously a north-south fault line. There are linguistic fault lines. There are you know religious fault lines in India. There are many other sources of, of division in India, but this is the main dividing principle on which Indian politics and society operate. And I think it's it's just very obvious to anyone who reads the history, who follows it through to today, or even who looks at the, you know, the main political rivalries in India today at the national level. This rivalry is dominated by what used to be called a rivalry between Hindustan and Englishstan. Uh, mm. you know, the, the national, the, the national elite and the comprador or internationalist elite, or as, you know, you might call it an ordinary, an everyday parlance, you know, new India and old India. The interesting thing that you are, uh, bringing out is the difference between the two thought processes. You also mentioned fault lines, and I wanted to ask you about that as the fault line concept did not, people knew about it but it didn't come into the forefront till the time the online narrative game started. And we saw that building up over time, right? So every country has fault lines. If you look at America, there is the North, South. Absolutely. Rural, rural urban, educated, yeah. less educated. These, these are all, you know, black, white. These, these are East all the sorts Coast, of fault lines. That, yeah, yeah, yeah. A, absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Now, what I'm trying to ask you when you've kind of dealt with data-driven narratives is that we see in India that when a fault line needs to be created, the data is, data has been used for that purpose. And we saw that with the British in the late 1890s when they did the first census which created the divide between the country. How do you see that concept, a 100, 120 year old concept being used today for its own purposes? I'm not sure how the British created this. Uh, uh, honestly, I, I'm not sure exactly to what you're referring that the census okay. created Let me, this fault line. If I may, sir, when the British were here, they had to figure out what kinds of population stays here. Now, in their system, there was a clear setup. This person is Catholic, this person is Protestant. And there's a clear division on the lines which have been created, which is not the case in ancient India. It was religious, but beyond that, nobody really cared. Well, well first, look, first, we don't really know that that's true of ancient India. We, we just don't have the data on ancient India. Pe people have, a, have built visions of ancient India that I think say much more about their what they want to see in their past than to how much we can actually know about ancient India. I, I don't want to get drawn too far into debate on that because I'm not a Sanskrit scholar. I'm not a scholar of ancient India. You know, so I'll just state that as my own feeling 
but I can't substantiate that. Um, regarding the British census, yes, the British put people in categories, and many of the categories that have stayed and through till today were perhaps solidified under British rule. But that's not the, the division I'm, I'm talking about. I mean, fundamentally, I'm talking about a division that was recognized at the time, uh, that's still recognized today. So if you go back to the Indian constitutional uh, constituent assembly debates, there was a huge debate in the constituent assembly about what name India should have. Should it be India or Bharat? Those who wanted Bharat, some of them also argued for Hindustan. Okay. And then you have the, the wildly popular book by J. Sai Deepak today, India that is Bharat. <laughs> right? Well, this, you know, this compromise that, well, we'll call it both, you know, is, is something that epitomizes this whole debate. It, you know, is, is the country fundamentally India, that is an English language construct of a country that's outward looking and engaged with the rest of the world and known as India in the rest of the world, uh, that is primarily pseudo secular. I, I won't call it actually secular, but that has a you know different set of values and that that is a universalist country that takes on from the rest of the world its its identity. Thus, you know, India in English or India in English, but was also in Persian in Greek. You know, that goes back all the way. Yes, it's derived from. The, in, the the it's derived ultimately from the Indus River, but that derivation is three thousand years old. All right, so for for us, we don't connect. We don't tend to connect the word India and the word Hindu in our minds, even if ultimately they have the same etymological origin. Okay. Is that India, or is India Hindustan or Bharat? Uh, and this debate, I mean, I just was in giving a lecture to a university classroom earlier today in which some of the students referred to their country as India and some of the students referred to their country as Bharat. And well, there's the division right there. <laughs> okay. Still existing today from the constituent assembly debates, right to a modern university classroom, people arguing, what's the name of our country? And I think when I say that that name dispute encapsulates all these other social realities, I think that's pretty well known in India. I don't think Indians need me to teach them that. They may be surprised that a Western observer recognizes that, but certainly they're not surprised at the observation. That's what I'm trying to understand, which is in the past two, three years, there's been a certain level of communication done with the rest of the world. There is a certain narrative which is built up and we can slowly see For the lack of a better word, Bharat slash Hindustan slash India being shown across. And what I really want to bring about is that there is an established sect which has been created by academia, think tanks and so on. And when these two worlds will actually collide, which is bound to happen anytime, how do you think the world will look at it? First, let's recognize that it's inevitable that the internationalist understanding of India as India, as English Dan, as a, a secular English-speaking country, that that understanding is automatically the understanding that will be picked up by international think tanks, by international universities, by definition, because the, the people in India who ascribe to that identity for their country are by definition the people who are who have access to these think tanks and networks. I mean, I often give people the thought experiment. Imagine a cocktail party in the Hamptons where New York Times editors are, are going and American political leaders and think, who are they more likely to meet there? Rahul Gandhi or Mohan Bhagwat? Well, <laughs> you know, it's comical even to think about Mohan Bhagwat being at a cocktail party in the Hamptons. You know, and and that pretty much tells that tells you everything I'm trying to say, which is that Inevitably, international views of India will accept the India as English stand narrative. Uh, inevitably, the social connections will be between India's international elite and Westerners. Uh, inevitably, those members of the national elite who primarily champion the use of the Hindi language or of other uh, regional languages in India, uh, inevitably, they will be separated 
from the global English language discourse. Uh, if you're going to, if you're committed to writing in Hindi and speaking in Hindi, you're not going to be writing op-eds for the New York Times, right? Uh, you know, it's simply inevitable. So uh, good or bad is for people to debate. Uh, right or wrong is for people to debate. Inevitable, uh, you know, I think clearly, and it doesn't represent any nefarious attempt on behalf of the West to impose an understanding of India. It represents the understanding that Western institutions are getting from those Indians who come to Western institutions to work in them, to study in them, to talk with them. Uh, that That is the understanding we're getting out of India. Again, people who write primarily in Hindi or in regional languages who may be important intellectuals in those languages, uh, uh, swamis who are preaching in in Indian languages are not going to get much purchase in Western think tanks in Washington, D.C. That's the whole problem, which a lot of us in India are not able to understand because the perception of India would be looked at from a certain line of thought where you start judging a certain construct, maybe a country, maybe a state, maybe anything it wants, as per the certain understanding that you have kind of built for yourself. When I, as an Indian, for example, look at the divorce rates in the West, I can understand it, I can appreciate the numbers, but I cannot fathom why this actually happens, because I don't see that around. Now this is a very innate human way of understanding, but that's a big problem because I'm never able to judge things for what they are. So yes, but India is in a different position vis-a-vis -vis this than, say, China. So, so one thing I've done a lot in my career is studying non-Western conceptions of what we call world society or non-Western worlding concepts. How do people see their societies from a Latin American indigenous perspective? I did one book on that. From a Chinese perspective, I did one book on that. And I'm working on a book you know, from the Indian perspective. The distinctive thing about the Indian perspective is that the fault line in India neatly follows the fault line between people who are fluent in English and people who are maybe speak English, but who are not fluent in English. Compare that to China. Okay, so China has multiple political fault lines within China. However, everyone is on an equal basis when it comes to going to Harvard to talk about them. That is, everyone has to learn English as a foreign language. Everyone is, has, is equally challenged by doing so. There's no group in China that are the interlocutors who are able to interpret China to the West. The people who interpret China to the West are primarily Western scholars who've learned Chinese. Okay. The people who interpret India to the West are primarily Indians who speak English. You don't have to rely in the West on Western scholars who speak Indian because you have plenty of Indians who speak English they can interpret India for us. I mean, let me just give you an example. I, I was at the Aspen Security Forum in July. That's the U.S., the big U.S. security conclave every year. Secretary of State Anthony Blinken was there. Condoleezza Rice was chairing it. Okay, it's, it's a big, powerful uh, panel of people. They had a China panel. All four experts in the China panel were U.S. China experts. Not a single one of them was even of Chinese heritage. They were all Americans who dedicated their lives to studying China. The India panel, which followed immediately after the Chinese panel, had one Pakistani American and three Indian citizens on the India panel. They told us about India or South Asia. The, the, the Pakistani American attempted to expand. You know, India was what was written in the program. She talked about South Asia <laughs> more broadly. That's understandable. Um, but in either way, these were all people who talked about their subjective experience of the country. The Pakistani American talking about her family back in Pakistan. The three Indians talking about their lived experience in India. Okay, so we got our knowledge of India and South Asia from four English speaking, English educated South Asians, you know, three of them Indian. 
um, who told us about the place from their perspective. We didn't hear from a single objective American expert who simply studied India as an external reality. So for us, China was something we got through our hard work and study learning about China. India was something we got by inviting some Indians <laughs> to come talk to us, right? Now, that's, that's, yeah, please. so that's great in one way in that Indians have access to this larger world because so many Indians do speak English. But on the other hand, it creates these enormous inbuilt biases where the, what we know about India, I mean, because of the coincidence that India is a British, former British colony and thus English is widely spoken, and the primary fault line in Indian society is between English Stan and Hindu Stan, or between you know, the English speaking elite and the national elite. Because those two converge, India is distinctively misunderstood in the West in a way that other countries aren't. I can even think of other former British colonies where English is widely spoken. So if you think in, in, in uh, let's stay local, think in, in Pakistan or Bangladesh, many people in Pakistan and Bangladesh speak English. But the primary fault line of Pakistani politics is not between those who speak English and those who don't. Right. The, the, the primary fault line of Bangladeshi politics is not between those. Yes, that is a fault line. You know, Pakistan especially has that to some extent. But, you know, that's not primarily what Pakistani politics are about. It's not like Congress versus BJP, right, where it's, it's just very clear as this is the division. Um, so India distinctively has this English local fault line and has people who speak English. Uh, it's resulted in this odd, it's not a misunderstanding of India. It's a selective understanding of India in the West. We're seeing India through a single frame instead of seeing India in its broader reality. That's kind of a problem. And I'd like to ask you, this is where a lot of us clash if I may, people that represent India have a certain bias and that will happen with every country because you have a different country, you have a different education, you have a different setup, you have everything is different. Now, they are also blinded by a political bias and I would say which one is correct is either BJP or Congress, that's particularly different but what I'm trying to say is they're going to be blinded by a political bias. The question that I want to ask you is that when certain people are invited to a certain forum, for example, if somebody is called by the People's Republic of China and the Chinese Communist Party says, well, he doesn't know much stuff, that his entire opinion will be null and void. But China, we know, is a different story altogether but you know what we see here in india is people who are representing us are largely indoctrinated and maybe indoctrinated is a big word yeah but i hope i'm understood when what i'm saying so these guys are indoctrinated in a particular narrative and brought in to perpetuate that particular narrative as they go forward the problem is that that is not the narrative of india how do you see that? Look, indoctrinated is only the right word if you accept that the other side is indoctrinated as well. We all have our doctrines and, and we, we teach our doctrines and people around us accept our doctrines. Uh, but the fact is that Americans in American universities, for example, for example, uh, here at the University of Sydney, several years ago, I invited the, pres the then president of the Indian Sociological Association to address our students. Now, I didn't invite her because of her politics in India. I invited her because she was the president of the Indian Sociological Association. Yeah. But we all can guess what the politics of the president of the Indian Sociological Association is likely to be. And of course, we heard that India under Narendra Modi had become a fascist state. That, that's simply what we, you know, what we heard. Um, now, the problem isn't that a Western institution is inviting people who are indoctrinated on one side or the other. Uh, the, the problem is that within India, historically, the people who held these positions that are the appropriate positions to be speaking to the West, right? who's going to speak for India? 
uh, well, clearly the editors of the major newspapers, the professors at the top universities, the heads of the main intellectual organizations, the heads of large NGOs. I, I mean, who else would we ask to speak for India? If I want to know about human rights in India, am I going to ask you know, an, an outsider intellectual who writes very popular books but has no university position? Or am I going to ask a professor of human rights? <laughs> well, of course I'm going to ask the professor of human rights. The problem we have is that in all countries, this is biased. In India, it's particularly so. But it would be the same if you wanted to ask Americans to talk about the U.S. I mean, for example, we know that more than 98% of American academics who give political contributions give them to the Democratic Party. So if you invite an American expert on U.S. politics to come talk in your country about U.S. politics, well, of course, you're going to get a professor of politics from Harvard, a professor of politics from Stanford, a professor of politics from Johns Hopkins. But chances are 98 to 2 uh, that you're picking someone who's a Democrat. Now, you didn't pick them because they're a Democrat. You pick them because they're occupying these positions that are the appropriate positions. And people often ask me, why does the Varieties of Democracy Institute have all of these Indian political scientists answering its survey um, who are on one side of politics? And I said, well, you know, who else would they pick? I mean, of course, they're going to go with professors of political science at major universities in India. Um, now, as that, in India, at least, this imbalance seems to be changing with time. There is a generational turnover in India that is not happening in the United States. In the United States, we're going the other direction. I mean, you could find Republican political scientists 50 years ago in the United States. You, you, you can't find them today. And that shapes, again, how narratives are drawn uh, about the United States and about U.S. politics. It shapes what books can be published. It shapes how the world understands us. Well. That's an unfortunate fact, but it's not a nefarious fact. You know, it's unfortunate, it's wrong, it's inappropriate, it biases us. But no one set out to do this. It's simply how institutional mechanisms have developed over time. I mean, what I'm trying to say here, and I think you've kind of hinted on it, and I'm trying to just dig it open a bit, is the fact that when you see a report coming out of, uh, I don't know, I don't want to take any particular sources, names, or anything like that. But when we see a press freedom index, we were lower than Afghanistan. Lower than every, I mean, lower than Hong Kong. I mean, 161st in the world. It's, it's ridiculous. It was ridiculous. Now, that tells you, and by the way, I don't want to get into hunger index or this and that or the other. By the way, hunger index, we were local, lower than Pakistan. Uh, hunger index is a, uh, let's talk about them separately. They have separate let problems. The, let the index be what they may be. I'm not talking about any particular index. The problem is the backing for these particular indexes. They have their political biases themselves. So, so there are better and worse indices. Um, so Press Freedom Index is one of the worst in the world. They're extremely opaque about their panels uh, who make them up. I strongly suspect that RSF is pulling journalists in India from uh, highly regime critical Outlets. Uh, I strongly suspect that very few of the people on RSF's panel for India work at mainstream publications. They're not. They're not coming from India Today, the Indian Express, uh, you know, the Hindu, the Economic Times. You, you know, they're coming instead from radical websites. I strongly suspect. Now, RSF will not. Quite naturally, will not tell us the. Uh, identities of the people who are answering its survey for India. That's as it should be. We want to they want to protect the integrity and, and you, you know, they don't want to see people being uh, influenced or even beaten up for their opinions. But if I were an editor at a major Indian newspaper, I would be strongly pressuring RSF. Tell us the distribution of institutional affiliations of your panel. Just tell us like what newspapers they're at. I mean, saying that RSF, if they were to disclose that they had two people on their panel from the Indian Express, that wouldn't cause any harm to any. It wouldn't. It wouldn't identify them. It would. You know, but it would give us some idea. Is anyone on the RSF panel from the Hindi language media? I mean, is anyone on the RSF panel from the Telugu language media, from the Kannada language media? You know, we don't know. Tamil language media, we have no idea. I think it would make the the RSF's index would be much more persuasive if they gave us some breakdown 
of where their surveyors, survey takers came from. And I'll tell you, I strongly suspect that they all come from online or almost yeah, all come from online cool. venues, not from mainstream newspapers and TV stations. Now, we simply can't take RSF seriously. There are other indices that are more serious, um, but lots of indices have problems. You mentioned World Hunger Index. Uh, I, I tell people World Hunger Index, flip it around, and it's the World Obesity Index. I mean, all it measures is how fat or skinny a country is. Now, in a world 50 years ago, where the world was very low on food intake, it was a hunger index. And the problem was not at the top, the problem was at the bottom. Today, it's the other way around. So today, the only countries that have real hunger are those in conflict situations, places like South Sudan, Ethiopia, Yemen, that have ongoing conflicts that result in challenges of food distribution. Places like India, Pakistan, don't have any actual, I'm, I'm not saying there's no individual who's hungry, I'm saying they don't have systematic problems of hunger and malnutrition. Those days are gone. Okay. Yet, because other countries have gotten relatively heavier, and India has not gotten as fat, so to speak, as other countries, it's on the bottom of this index. But like I said, if we simply flip the index, India is now one of the top performing countries above Pakistan, you know, and, and everyone will be celebrating it. And so I think each index has its own problems, but RSF. Reporter Sans Frontiers, World Press Freedom Index, is notoriously bad. Uh, you know, whether it's here in Australia, um, in New Zealand, or indeed in India, I don't think anyone should take it seriously at all. For me, the problem is obviously that, and something else that you've mentioned, which I'd like to deep, uh, go deeper into. One is that there is a method of financing such activities. So I was doing a little research some time ago. And I realized that you would agree with me that India's best friend is George Soros. Um, <laughs> He's passed the keys over to his son, who is completely uh, re reformulating the uh, the Open Society Institute. So you may be saying next next podcast, oh, India's best friend is <laughs> Soros' son. I don't know. No, I, I'll, I'll, I'll wait for it. Uh, and he's not just, you know, the problem is not that it's he's hated in India. He's hated in America itself. You see the podcast being done by a lot of people, prominent people in America. People who are standing for the presidential elections have started talking about him. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's fun to poke fun at him. Yeah, yeah. Now, when we see that, uh, funnily speaking, India has a small problem between people who put out certain information and the so-called fact-checkers. You have that systemic war going on between these two groups. It's only when you scratch the surface and start doing some research on these organizations, you realize that they have been funded by George Soros. Exactly what I'm saying, you know, so there is a problem here. Your academics have a political bias, your research papers have are flawed. What were we talking about? You know, your, 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 your ranking in indices are flawed and then you've got the fact checkers with a certain bias uh, this is an all-out narrative war at the end of it. it it is but people in other countries generally don't take it as seriously <laughs> as indians do um you know we, we we kind of recognize that these are good for a laugh you know they get reported in the press and everyone forgets about them uh you know look australia's rating on the press freedom index rose dramatically this year so, you know it rose by a huge number and then in terms of points it rose by i think i think it was 12 places it, it, it rose you know it was a huge boost for australia's press freedom and the reason was simple. The, the liberals lost the election in Labour won. And conservatives out, you know, socialists in, and press freedom rises. Now, nothing changed in the underlying structure of the Australian press. Uh, but, you know, this is how it works. And, and look, and people are aware of that. And that's why it, people don't take it seriously. India, however, uh, you know, stands out. And, and I think a lot of this matters to India because India is the only bona fide democracy 
in the developing world. Uh, I mean, I'm sorry to be so categorical, but it's hard to find another well-institutionalized bona fide democracy with the full panoply of democratic institutions, with a vibrant free press, you know, with dozens of newspapers, with, you know, competing points of view, with hard fought elections where nobody knows who's going to win. I mean, everyone, well, I'm sorry, in India, everyone knows who's going to win, but only 50% of them are right. Um, you know, in, India is the only developing country in this situation. And as a result, well, in other developing countries, no one takes this seriously because they're not democratic anyway. Uh, and in developed countries, no one takes these seriously because people are secure enough in the sense, I mean, no one doubts that Australia is a democracy. And so when Australia gets downgraded and New Zealand across the Tasman is rated best in the world, no Australian takes that seriously. They all know that New Zealand's democracy is really quite questionable and of relatively low quality compared to Australia's, no matter what the indices may say. And if, if Australians were told New Zealand's rated second in the world for the quality of its democracy, yeah, no one in Australia would take, everyone in Australia would take it with a grain of salt because they're familiar with New Zealand, they're familiar with Australia, and they're comfortable that Australian democracy really is um, much more competitive. Uh, so India is in this odd situation of being the only country that cares because it's the only country, I mean, you have to go down by, a, you know, you have to go up by a factor of four in GDP per capita to find other bona fide democracies other than India. And I think people have not sufficiently worked that into their understanding when thinking about the country. It is a dramatic difference between India and the rest of the democratic world. That's so interesting that you say that because at the end of it, New Zealand is supposed to be the crown of democracy as we know it. Or at least ah, but but why, well, why is that the perception? Because you've seen it in the indices. Not because you know a single thing about New Zealand democracy. You probably don't even know who the New Zealand prime minister is. Yeah. Frankly, I can't remember his name. I mean, Jacinda Ardern uh, stepped down. The other labor guy <laughs> came into office. And we don't even know his name. Yet you feel comfortable saying that New Zealand is the epitome of democracy. How? Oh, because you read it in an index. And interestingly, you have a country like Canada with a prime minister like Justin Trudeau who believes in silencing voices. I mean, he, I saw him recently doing that in one of these town halls. Now, that's their culture. I mean, that's that's all right. But Oh, uh, I'm sorry to interrupt. Compare the trucker protests in Canada with the trucker protests or the farmer protests in India. Very similar protests of people blocking a major public, an important public road, you know, preventing the distribution, uh, you know, smooth distribution of logistics. They wouldn't move. You know, in Canada, they debanked them. They literally had banks freeze their bank accounts so that they couldn't eat, they couldn't pay their mortgages, they couldn't use their credit cards, they wouldn't let people donate to them. They put blocks, even on using uh, GoFundMe and other internet ways to fund them. The only way people could fund Canadian truckers was via Bitcoin. Now, imagine, just imagine if Narendra Modi had taken the farmers at the farmers' protest, had cut off their access to the financial system, had not allowed donations to be made, George Soros would have never let us hear the end of it. Well, you know, Mr. Soros, where are you when it comes to Justin Trudeau? Well, Canada is a democracy. That's different. <laughs> right now, now, I, now I, I could be cute and say, oh, Canada's white, and that's different. It sure looks like that. Now, it's not that. I guarantee you, it's not racism. But it is developmentalism. Oh, Canada's rich and developed. It's not like that for Canada. Right. Um, Scott Morrison rich. here in Australia, uh, former prime minister, he signed himself into four different cabinet portfolios to sign off on uh, regulations that he knew his ministers would not accept. And he did it secretly without telling anybody. He secretly held five different portfolios at the same time in cabinet. It only came out after he lost the election. Could you imagine if Narendra Modi had signed himself into five portfolios to take over the cabinet secretly? Well, maybe he's done it secretly and we don't know. <laughs> but, uh, you know but, but if this had come out, it would have been, that's the end of Indian democracy. In Australia, it's, well, it was probably, you know, it's a dubious legality, but he hasn't been prosecuted. There's been no issue around it here in Australia. 
It's just felt like, well, he shouldn't have done that probably, right? And, and no one has criticized Australian democracy for it, okay? So, you know, we have different standards and we apply different standards because India is literally the only developing country that is a genuine bona fide democracy. We don't apply the same standards because we apply the standards of the developing world to India where we apply the... Oh, what's the word for it? You know, we apply the, 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 the broad indulgence that we apply to all other developed countries, to Canada or to Australia or to New Zealand. Sir, this has been very interesting, but I have two more questions. You had an interaction with the Indian left and uh, you did a podcast or a video with, uh, with one of these uh, uh, newscasters. So, sir, I want to ask you, uh, because the perception of left is left is liberalism right supposedly inclusive liberal let stuff happen the way they are it's okay and then in india the right is known as the danda raj you know the stick um, have the roles kind of uh, reversed well people say those result roles have reversed in the united states for that matter uh, i i i take a a more skeptical view of this, to be quite honest. Um, look, left and right are not terms that really apply to, certainly not to American politics. I, I mean, and I don't even think to Indian politics either. Uh, you know, I mean, the left and right apply to the, the French Revolution. They come out of continental Europe. Continental Europe has a clear left, which is, you know, socialist, communist. It has a clear right, which is, you know, monarchist or fascist in its extremes. Uh, you know, none of that applies to India. None of that applies to the U.S. or Australia. So although we use the words left and right, they don't necessarily apply. And so when you say left liberal, it's like, well, the Democratic Party in the United States is a coalition between a rump left. America doesn't have much of a left, but it does have some socialists and liberals in America. Well, because the Democratic Party is a left liberal coalition doesn't mean that left and liberal are somehow together in other countries. Uh, you know, the Labour Party in the UK is not very liberal at all. It, it's a, firmly a Labour Party and a Labourite socialist party. So in India, it's the same sort of questions I would raise. That the liberal traditions are not necessarily held by the left or people who call themselves leftists. Now, I would be more concerned if people who had a, an explicitly liberal point of view were seeking to quash debate. Um, I, I don't know that I've experienced that in India. I've talked to, like, for instance, if I were to name a liberal I've talked to, I was on Barka Dutt's program. Now, Barka Dutt, I think, is a, 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 a liberal. You know, she's not, she's not a, a kind of raving socialist, tear down the institutions, nationalize the industries, right? I mean, and well, she was very critical of me, but also very patient. She listened. She had a robust discussion with me. That's great. When I talk to News Laundry, which may be who you were referring to, well, yeah, they're a bunch of leftists, right? They, I think, I think they self-identify as leftists. I'm not sure. They certainly seem to be very leftist in the scheme of things, in politics. Um, they were not civil. But on the other hand, I've also talked to people who identify as right-wingers who were not civil in the Indian debate. Uh, yeah, you know, so I, I don't know that that says much. I, I mean, most of us in most Anglophone countries find ourselves, broadly speaking, in the liberal camp, accepting liberal values. And I have to say, throughout 99% of the interactions I've had in India, uh, they've been broadly well-tempered, pleasant, you know, people who really want to talk, have a discussion. Uh, I have, you know, no, no cause for complaint on that score. I mean, you can disagree to something. That's perfectly all right. There's nothing wrong with that. There, there's, there's no need to kind of cut each other's head off. In India today, we see two sort of structures emerging today. One is India, that is Bharat. People want to learn about their cultures, go back to the past, their roots and stuff like that. And then there's the other side, which is a little more westernized where people have decided that uh, we need to 
be a part of the world you know uh, not that being bharat is not being a part of the world but you know what i mean it's it's a different context the question is that when we look at the west from here this is 1.4 billion people looking at it we look at an incident and we say oh god that's really sad you know stuff happens for example the gun culture but we innately don't judge the entire culture to say that every western man is carrying a gun man or woman is carrying a gun and if there's anything else talk that's that's it but whereas the west when they look at an incident within india and mind you uh, we are 1.4 billion people things are going to go wrong once in a while what happens is that we see a generalization of india with one incident followed by academics with detailed reports and studies and then followed up by fact checkers and then george soros and this and that and everything what is the opportunity for us to come out and say listen what are you guys doing is this the right thing look this is a problem but it's it's an epistemological problem it's not an india problem um so all i have to do is point you to the entire black lives matter protest movement in the united states and the riots that accompanied with it all because of the murder of george floyd an, an african american well we know that statistically uh blacks are more likely or I'm sorry whites are more likely than blacks to be killed in police custody uh we know that statistically deaths in police custody are extremely rare for african americans there's been enormous progress here that wasn't the case 40 years ago it is the case now uh we know that you know this is that the george floyd experience did not represent the statistical experience of african americans in the united states yet ask anyone around the world and you'll hear it brought up to show how continuing racism dominates america not only in the world in the united states itself where journalists should know better they still choose to pick up this narrative so i'm afraid this is not an, a, a problem that's specific to india it's a problem that's specific to every country that has a free media because journalistic understandings of the world focus on the particular case not on the statistical prevalence now personally i'm only saddened and disappointed when social scientists accept these journalistic understandings and then present them as truth when in fact we should be very skeptical of these journalistic understandings of our own countries and of other countries and be asking for systematic data but you know it's 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 not only india that has this challenge it's it's every democratic country deals with this and you know has to find a solution for it just a small follow up but when you read the new york times washington journal uh, washington post and the wall street journal if there are let's say 30 opinion pieces three of them talk about india why there are 194 countries in the world well they talk about india much much more than they talk about most other <laughs> countries in the world what's But, this obsession with india Oh, no, there's not an obsession with India. I think there should be more India coverage. I, I think a large part of the problem. I, I, no, I think a large part of the problem is that our Indian coverage is so facile for a country that's so important in the world. I mean, if you compare it, you know, India being roughly the same population as China, now slightly larger. Um, you know, the fact that India, well, if you think of three zones of the world, Africa, India, and China, of the three, there are three are similar in population. yet Africa and China get much more coverage than India does uh, you know i think part of the problem is that we know so little about india if we knew more about india if we had a greater depth of coverage a greater multiplicity of voices in the india debates we might have a more nuanced understanding of the country uh, unfortunately all we get is this little sliver of knowledge coming from a small number of usual suspects uh who write op-eds for these three newspapers and similar you know, and the London Times and the Guardian um that really color our knowledge of India disproportionately affect our knowledge of India when India's systemic importance really really warrants are having much greater India coverage oh sir this is going to be a wonderful interview for all a lot of my audience because one of the questions that is asked to me quite often by a lot of people is that why do they these guys do not like us what's wrong with us 
we're just living our life the way we want to. So right, I mean, there's a confusion about that. And you have your own country, you do what you want to. We have our own country, we do what we want to. We don't comment about uh, the fact that you have only fun pages for your girls and what is happening in terms of your societies and stuff like that. People are getting aggressive. Are getting aggressive. There is a hard pushback, but, but they're primarily pushing back against Indians. Uh, I mean, I'm, I'm sorry to keep repeating this, but the phrase that made me famous in India was India's intellectuals are anti-India. And it's been endlessly misunderstood because, you know, I'm sorry, your readers, your, your listeners may not want to hear this. I'm convinced that Rajdeep Sardesai is an incredibly patriotic Indian who is in no way anti-India. What I meant by that phrase was that our negative understandings of India come primarily from Indians. They don't come from Westerners who spent a lifetime studying India and who are now reporting back their understandings to us. There's a little of that, but let's face it, most Westerners who study India don't study contemporary India. They, they study Sanskrit or they study Hinduism or they, they study uh, you know, medieval India. Uh, you know, there are very few Westerners who study contemporary India. There are probably fewer than I have fingers uh, who study India in any serious way. Well, compare that to how many Westerners study China. I mean, there's a whole industry of Westerners who study China. Um, it, it's Indians who are telling us this about India, not it's, it, it's, yes, it's coming via the New York Times and the Washington Post. Look at the bylines on those articles and you'll recognize those names as being distinctively Indian names. In any case, Professor, this was wonderful. Let me assure you, I'm grateful that you spent some time with me to kind of help us understand your perspective and your learnings from India. It's always a pleasure talking to you and listening to you. I hope that you come back to me for another podcast sometime so that we can have continue our interaction in the future. Well, it's great to talk to you and thanks for having me on the show. Thank you, sir.